Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A, coming to you from the Holy Land. Rabbi Tobias Singer. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you, sir? It's good to have you back, always. Big pleasure to have me back. <laughs> of course. Of course, of course. Um. I, uh, real quickly, we're going to have to kind of keep doing this probably every week for a while anyway. Um, I hope not. Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> so, so the question still arises. Um, now it's kind of a new question might have, have actually popped up. Is It seems like that the God TV thing, even though they haven't approved their seven-year uh, seven contract, that they're still letting them broadcast live. Is that is that the case right now? Yeah, so they're uh, so they're rolling through different shows. I don't get hot TV, so I couldn't tell you. Okay. Uh, I I can't report to you what I know. I don't know. It, it is on. That means uh, channel one eighty two is Shalano. I don't know what what they're broadcasting now. My my sense is what they have in mind, uh, meaning bringing on the most dangerous missionaries were there to convert uh, in the words of the CEO of God TV 9 million uh, Jews in Israel to Christianity so that I don't know if that has begun yet my sense is it isn't I, I would have heard about it but there is a, a deafening silence because since the cutoff time when the, a decision would be rendered is nearly, it's about 10 days ago or so. Right, right. So it's, um, I'm as astonished as as many are, and we continue to look into this, um, you know, as we're speaking. So we want to get a decision on this. But so, I, don't, I don't have, I don't have, Okay. No information. On this. <clears throat> well, uh, it has been brought up. Uh, Shannon Newsom had mentioned that's probably a good time uh, if, if anybody is still interested in helping out with this this whole idea uh, to flood hot t uh, hot TV's. Is it called hot TV? Is that what it is? Yeah. Hot TV's Facebook page, um, and just you know, just just keep it going, keep it going, keep that friction. Um, you know, because I mean, being complacent is not going to help uh, for sure. So. Okay, very good. Oh, hold on a second. It looks like... Oh, yeah, yeah. We're good. We're good. Do you want to, like, just not show up by saying a few uh, nice <laughs> things about me? Or just, just assume? <laughs> oh, man. You know, there's not enough time in the 24-hour There period. isn't. There <laughs> isn't. There isn't. <laughs> but presumably, given that I'm up against I Love Lucy and people are reruns and people are still watching this is indicative that this is something very special. <laughs> that is very true. Well, I suppose uh, we could uh, say a few nice things about you, but that would be a completely, completely inappropriate. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, did, let me just ask you a question. Do you wake up and your hair is just that, that like Elvis Presley-ish when you wake up, you never even strike a comb through it or what? In truth, I'm very lucky in this regard. I... No, I mean, I have to, you know, but I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I know people ask, there must be, like, hours in the makeup room and <laughs> hairdresser to get this, to get this. But you wake up and your and, makeup's just perfect. That's it's beautiful. Yeah. No, I, people <laughs> think that I have a trainer, you know, to You're funny. be in this kind of shape. People ask me all the time, how do you do it? How do you maintain? <laughs> and it's just... It's, I just won a genetic lottery. That's it. That's funny. That's funny. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to this uh, onto this first call. Oh, Welcome to the show. <laughs> Please tell us your name where you're talking about. Hi. This is Van calling from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, qu question uh, about uh, Jesus and his sayings. Uh, Jesus said a lot of things that uh, are pretty, pr pretty profound and... Uh, and serious and, and heavy weight, 
uh, his stories, parables, uh, morals. Uh, you know, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Uh, uh, render to Caesar those things that are Caesar's, uh, to God those things that are God's, those, those types of things. H- how could any mere mortal um, think of that stuff? How, how could any mere mortal come up with the wisdom uh, attributed to to Jesus? So if, uh, you know, pretty simple question, I think. Uh, hmm. uh, if somebody could, if, if the rabbi could address that issue, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks much. All right, hang up now. You can call in for, for your answer. Okay, thanks. All right, Rabbi, take it away. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I've never actually, I, I will say I've never in, in my entire um, walk I've ever had that brought up. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, it's an interesting question. You know, I, a fellow um, wrote me about six months ago, and he's like a, a real music. He's a musicologist, whatever. And he, he thought that Jesus had to be the Messiah because Handel's Messiah was such a beautiful, such a beautiful musical work with the most extraordinary chorals. That it had to be the it had he had to be div, it had to be divinely inspired, and then when I told him that the passages from which those uh, that piece of music was taken that the translation had been completely obliterated by Christian translators, uh, he was kind of stunned. But it was a very interesting thought. I'd never come across anything like that. Um, and then when I shared with him that, you know, many people think that although the Church of the Latter-day Saints is, um, their theology is wanting somewhat, the ideas advanced by the by Mormons that Jesus is going to make a second coming in Jackson, Missouri, was absurd, but in fact, they have a great, they have a great choir, but that just doesn't. Um, there's, that's there's no relationship between the two. Uh, so let me go to the question uh, that's asked, and the question is asked is that the parables of Jesus in the New Testament are 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 so uh, awesome and. And pregnant with wisdom, that the person who conveyed them must be the Messiah. And so, this is one of those questions that's really very interesting. It's interesting because it gives me a sense of how Christians think. So, but so, and this is one of those questions where I'm not sure how to begin. So, let me begin in the most natural way. So, as it turns out, uh, let's take those two stories. Uh, the one one is the the woman who is brought the woman in adultery who is brought to Jesus, and that story which is so famous, it's like in every Jesus movie, uh, occupies twelve verses in the book of John, from John chapter seven verse fifty three to John chapter eight verse eleven, and the st- the story is is such a a neat story that every Jesus movie that I can think of includes it, even if there's if it has nothing to do with with the movie. Uh, when when our good friend and the great luminary and one of the good the great allies of the Jewish people. Mel Gibson came out with the with the movie The Passion of Christ. So even though that movie uh, was devoted to depicting the the passion of Jesus of Christ, in that sense, the passion means the the suffering and the, and the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, some Mel Gibson made sure to have a flashback in the movie of going back to that great story of 12 passages in the book of John. So, and 
the story essentially goes that Jesus was teaching his disciples and Pharisees, opponents of Jesus, brought to Jesus a woman whom they reported uh, was caught in the act of adultery. And they asked him what should be done with her. After all, the law of Moses is very clear that a woman who commits adultery should be stoned. So this raises a, a real dilemma for Jesus because what does he do? He's in what appears to be in a no-win situation. This this story has like all the features that make a great movie because great movies always have this impossible conundrum, how are you going to ever get out of this problem? And then Jesus manages to do it. And... And Jesus essentially then says to the men who are ready to stone her, he says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And the men who were standing there all thought to themselves and concluded, well, they all dropped their stone and walked away, meaning that they all had sin. And the woman, Jesus asked, what's the woman what's the deal and she said that they all left and she's and i'm jesus is the only one left and he says well then i don't condemn you also go and sin no more so he gets out of that i don't know if it's a parable but what it is is it's invented meaning i don't know how to say this in a, a nicer way but this story while has a, a great snap to it, was is not a part of the original book of John. And almost all evangelical scholars that I know of can see this. This is one of those big blocks of text in the Christian Bible that were not originally there. And then it was later put in centuries after the earliest manuscripts that we have in our hands, 66, 75, and so on. So, in fact, an Origins copy, it, it had uh, sort of markings on it that it, was, um, that it was an interpolation. There are many later Greek manuscripts that have that as well. So as it turns out, virtually, not all, you know, you have these guys who are very you know, whatever, King James only guys, they wouldn't concede anything. But as it turns out, the oldest and best manuscripts of the New Testament lack this great story. It's just not there. And to, um, and I have to confess that some of the, the most ardent evangelical conservative apologists completely concede that both this section of 12 passages and another section of 12 passages, I'm not getting into now, but those are the last 12 passages in the book of Mark. Even people like Dan Wallace uh, from Dallas Theological Seminary, he's a really conservative guy. They all can see that this was a later edition. So there you go. So there you go. So it's a, it's a great story, and Jesus didn't come up with it. So are we to say that whoever invented this story centuries later, then he's the Messiah? Because you can come up with great parables. And as it turns out, there are just so many religions, Hindu religions, that have terrific teachers, gurus, all of India, who, who teach in Paris, Sai Sai Baba, who died not that long ago, not only did he resurrect the dead and heal the blind and heal the cripple in front of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, but he told over all these parables that that doesn't mean they're the Messiah. In order to be the Messiah, the Tanakh tells us not that you can come up with great parables or great stories. Tanakh tells us that the way th there are events that will occur that convey that the Mashiach is here. Very specifically, there'll be a worldwide peace. That didn't happen 
in the first century. There was nothing, not only wasn't there a peace that seized the world, there was a war and ultimately a destruction of a temple when, in fact, Scripture tells that a temple is to be built in the coming of days of the coming of the Mashiach. See the end of Ezekiel chapter 37, just the last three the last three passages of that chapter, the whole end of the book of Ezekiel, that, that's what the Messiah is supposed to do, not come up with clever parables, which people like the Dalai Lama come up with all the time. Um, so that's, so there's, the, so first of all, the examples you raise are actually not authentic, and even the vast majority of Christian scholars, of conservative, I'm not saying liberal Christians. I'm not saying, you know, the whoever the rector is of St. John in New York, which is an Anglican, a liberal high church Anglican, you know, Anglican church, meaning they're really liberal guys. You know, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about conservative in general. Oh, this is largely conceded uh, the issue of um, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's so that's that's not really even a parable uh, that's a, a story that shows up in the synoptic gospels it shows up in in Mark and Mark 12 for example so here you have uh, it's it's kind of similar to John in that the enemies of Jesus and who are they? Well, they're not the Puerto Ricans; they're the Jews. <laughs> I really, I really, any Christian that doesn't just hate Jews, I just ta- to read this kind of stuff and not it's really shocking. In any event. Um, Jews are again trying to catch Jesus in a uh, making a mistake, and they begin in uh, Mark twelve, let's say verse seven or eight around there. Uh, yeah, Jesus is at, you know at, after being praised for being knowledgeable, asked you know are are we supposed to be paying taxes to the Roman Empire? This is a this is a really big issue. Now, and if you're watching this and you're an American, you might not understand the significance of the question. And the significance of the question is twofold. Number one, the Jews were at war with Rome in the first during the first century during that time. When I say at war, it wasn't the great the great war that began in sixty six and ended in seventy. The whole first century was a nightmare. It just culminated in, you know, it just culminated in those last three years with the destruction of the Second Temple, and then three years later with the destruction of Masada. But it was just a, the whole the whole first century until the destruction of the Second Temple was a, a, it could, is marked by enormous tension between the the Pharisees in particular and the scribes, essentially the same thing, and Rome. And sometimes these battles came up over paying taxes because uh, the Jews resented paying taxes and being overtaxed and paying, paying taxes to a, a, a pagan empire and moreover, the coins that were used had images on it, which the Jews considered detestable, uh, coins of uh, of the of Caesar. So, who and these emperors of Rome either were gods or were going to become gods once they died. So you could see how just the historical. You need to have some historical context to be able to understand why these stories that we find in the Synoptic Gospels to be so interesting, because at the time, living in Rome means you were living in a, under a brutal empire. And there, were, there were times when the, some 
Roman leader just decide to to slaughter Jews because they put up a an image of the empire of Jupiter on the Temple Mount, and Jews, of course, took it down. Don't ask. There was it was slaughters. It was a nightmare. Jews didn't want to give, didn't want to contribute to such a a godless empire. Not just godless. Not that it was just neutral, neutral, but it was one that was an enemy of everything that was. And secondly, the image that was on the coin. Incidentally, if you if you think I'm making up the thing about the image of the emperors on the coinage, it actually says that in the text. It tells us the the denomination it was, and it had a picture of the emperor on it, an image of the emperor on it. So Jesus then says, well, you know, render unto Caesar what Caesar's, which translation means, you know, whatever belongs to the government, give to the government, and whatever is What's the parable? I'm not even sure what the parable is. The parable, what is being conveyed is if it belongs to the empire, then give it to the empire and essentially segregate uh, your responsibilities um, to the empire to your own personal responsibilities. So I'm now there are parables in the Christian Bible. But as it turns out, that's not what makes someone the Messiah. What makes someone the the Messiah is that they will bring about a worldwide knowledge of God. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. So much so that the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. So what we have as a Jew looking at this and saying, okay, so we have, I mean, these are not even parables, but there are parables in the Christian Bible. In fact, about a third of the teachings attributed to Jesus in the Gospels are are parables. So what you have is Jesus fulfilling nothing of what we are told explicitly by Isaiah, that there would be, that nations will be so so moved by the message of Mashiach, he'll give them haichacha, which means rebuke, that they'll take all their implements of war, swords and spears, and turn them into plowshares and pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. None of that happened. None of that occurred. But parables, we're told, occurred where is that? Where does Tanakh say that? We have a Bible that tells us that the that the uh, about the immortality of the soul and the physical resurrection of the dead. Daniel chapter twelve, verse two. Isaiah chapter twenty six, verse nineteen. It didn't happen. This is a promise. the The coming of Elijah the prophet prior to usher in the coming of the Messiah, did not happen. That's conveyed to us explicitly at the very end of the prophetic part of the Jewish scriptures, right at the end of the book of Malachi. So you you don't, so what Tanakh tells us is not that you're going to have a teacher who's going to tell great stories. In fact, it's it's hard for me to think of a great teacher prophet, guru, and so on, who wasn't a masterful communicator. They all were, or they wouldn't have had a following. So here's what we we're looking for. Why are we looking for this? Because Jews just hate Christ, hate Jesus, hate Christianity, hate the... No, this is all wrong. That's how we're characterized, and I understand why Christians think this about us. We are so poorly misunderstood. We, we simply look at explicit prophecies in Tanakh of what are the markers for the coming of Mashiach. The worldwide knowledge of God. All the nations will speak in a pure speech. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. Didn't happen. The world was, was, a, was a result of the, of, the, of the Christian religion and the empire despair. People were we're at war with each other. I, I, there's no other religion 
that committed more bloodshed than those who were followers of Jesus. Protestant and Catholics, don't tell me they weren't real Christians. In fact, the the bloodiest religious war in human history was fought between Catholics and Protestants, launched in 1618 and came to a close in 1648. By 1648, the Holy Roman Empire was decimated. Eight million people were killed. And that's in the 17th century. That was at a time which lacked the technology that we have today to kill so many so quickly. Never before and never since had religion sparked more bloodshed than the than what is called the Thirty Year War, which triggered had a massive effect on the Enlightenment. Whatever it was, it was. I mean, the Holy Roman Empire was decimated. A war fought by who? Between Christians, among Christians. That's exactly what. The Messiah is not supposed to do. His teachings are not supposed to trigger this. So it, no one in the Holy Roman Empire, both Protestant and Catholic, none, none of them were none of them were real Christians, really? And Calvin, a thug and a murderer, he wasn't a real Christian. That's exactly what Tanakh tells us. So um, so here, here's the deal. I want to just wrap this up. Judaism is sometimes referred to as rabbinic Judaism. I, usually the people who use that term don't mean that as a compliment, but I'm willing to embrace it. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our rabbis. Just name them off for you. Rabbi Moses, our greatest prophet. Rabbi Isaiah, Rabbi Ezekiel, Rabbi Jeremiah. These are our great rabbis. These are, our, these are the greatest rabbis. Devora, a prophetess, Hulda, a prophetess. The, the prophets were the greatest men and women that ever lived in human history. Those are the people that we follow, who God used them because of their greatness as an oracle to convey some of the, some of the greatest teachings in history. To use their voice as a, as a vessel to convey eternal teachings. And there's nothing there, there's nothing in Tanakh that tells us that the Messiah is going to be able to produce great parables. Nothing. In fact, what we do find in Tanakh is we do find a lot about what Mashiach will say. We really do. And, and, and that is haichacha. It's literally the words used in Isaiah 2, Micah 4. These are very famous chapters, messianic chapters. Just breathe them and you, you just glow. So those are, the, those are the things that the Messiah is supposed to do. Uh, and as it turns out, it's not that just Christianity didn't, um, didn't meet the mark of fulfilling those prophecies. The very antithesis of what was prophesied by Isaiah occurred during the Christian century. There was no worldwide peace, Isaiah 2 and, and 11 and other passages. But there was war. There was no building of a temple, Ezekiel 40 through 48. There was a destruction of a temple in the year 70. Every, the, the Christian century is the antithesis of what is supposed to occur in the Messianic age. In fact, if you want to know what is supposed to happen when the Messiah comes, gather around, boys and girls, let me tell you. Look at the first... 70 years of the first century, and whatever you see, it's the opposite. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to be cute. It really is. If you look at the, the first three quarters of the first century, so whatever happened, it's the reverse. There's supposed to be an ingathering of the exiles, Isaiah 43, verse 6. That's a messianic prophecy. And this is a prophecy that all Jews and Christians agree are messianic. God's going to call to the north and to the south, give up my daughters. He will bring us back from the ends of the earth. A, a worldwide peace that would seize the world as a result of the teachings of the Messiah. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. 
I know Christians all know Zechariah 9, verse 9. So what we're being told is that a, a parable, which is really a forgery, added in later, that's the hallmark of the Messiah? Hmm? The, the fact that, that those 12 passages in John 8, 7, 53 through 8, 11, appear in the Christian Bible is a disgrace to the Christian Bible. Now, one caveat, one caveat must be said, and that is a great many Christian Bibles are somewhat honest about this, and although they don't remove John 7.53 through um, John 8.11, 7.53 is the last passage of the seventh chapter, they'll usually... I don't know if you, I, I didn't do a survey of this, but very, very, very frequently there'll be brackets around those 12 passages. And in the, um, in the margin or in the annotation, the, the Christian translator and publisher will concede everything I've told you. And it's not because they're a big fan of Rabbi Tovia Singer, because I'm telling you, it's just. Yeah, so as it turns out, someone did invent those words, and it wasn't Jesus, that's for sure. Because it, it, it isn't in the earliest and best manuscripts of the New Testament. So remember this, the signs of the coming of the true Mashiach is something that we can all see. And that is the unity of mankind, and they will turn to Hashem, and God will be one, and his name will be one. Zechariah 14, verse 9. Let us pray that we will merit to witness the coming of the true Mashiach, Bimheder Biyamenu, quickly in our time. Thank you for that thoughtful question. Amen. All right, moving on to the next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. You're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Reyes, and I'm from Southern California. Reyes, welcome. Thank you for calling. Hey, good morning, William, and good morning, Rabbi Singer. Uh, I have a question. It might be nitpicking, but uh, I was reading the New Testament the other day, and in First Peter 2, uh, they have the directive to obey your slave masters, even the cruel ones. Mm. And to me, it seems like a contradiction to God's desire to free the Jews from Pharaoh because, um, I mean, Pharaoh was cruel to them, and them being free would be in direct, you know, he didn't want them to be free. That would be them disobeying their, their slave master. So I'm just wondering how, how do Christians reconcile this? Or am I just nitpicking? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I just want to hear Rabbi's stance on that. Okay, very good. And that was First Peter chapter, I just, chapter I'm 3, right? I'm not sure I, I got the question because you sort of, your audio faded out in the beginning. Could you just, uh, would you just run over that again? I just want to make sure I got that. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So how, do, how would a Christian reconcile that in First Peter 2.18, they have the direct to obey your slave master with God freeing the Jews from a cruel slave master being Pharaoh? How would they reconcile that? Am I nitpicking, or do, is, is that in a contradiction? I mean, I don't know how they would reconcile that. Like, we have the Christian Bible saying to obey your slave master, and then we have the Jews disobeying the slave master, wanting to be freed, and then being freed, and then and going away from him. I mean, how would a Christian reconcile that? That seems like a contradiction I, to me. I understand. I understand what you're saying. Very great. Okay, great question, actually. So let's go ahead and disconnect, and you can tune in for your answer, okay? Thank you for call. Thank you very much. You betcha. Bye-bye. All right, man. So that question is raised a lot by non-Christians. Um, and not only do we have it in in First Peter two, where slaves and these are not because I know someone's going to come up with this, but are there slaves in the Torah? That is totally different. The, the slaves in the Torah are people who became a part of their the family. I'm talking about non-Jewish slaves, and um, and then enjoyed all the benefits of the family and also bore the responsibility of the family. Uh, but these were slaves in the empire. This is a whole different ball game. And why it's not only here in First Peter, you have it also in the letters of Paul. You have even a whole letter. You have an entire letter from the hand of Paul, which is indisputed, that's all about a runaway slave. 
So it's not, I don't even, I don't know who wrote first Peter. I could just, I can assure you it wasn't Peter. But you have a book called Philemon, which is all about the runaway slave. And Paul doesn't say, keep running. (laughs) Get out of here. (laughs) You know, get out of the South and make your way to New York. And here's a, here's a few bottles. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry. And and here's a, a few bottles of Fiji ice cold Fiji water to so you make it. <laughs> this was uh so let me just so we actually so even though um uh, first Peter is claimed that Peter is the author of those epistles, um I don't believe it for a second. I, I most New Testament scholars, unless you're from the conservative evangelicals, don't believe that either for so many reasons. But frankly, if I was going to bring passages where Paul uh, encourages uh, slaves to be to be dutiful to their masters, that was in the empire. You know, I, I would go to actual Pauline epistles and, and find that. And I, I don't, you know, because because it's not the word of God. I mean, it's those questions that you should really be posing to. Those are questions that really should be posed to Christians. Now, yeah, I mean, what can I tell you? I can't. I don't know what to say. But as it turns out that's all that's all over the place. When I say all over the place, it's all over the place in in uh, in books that are attributed to Paul. And some of them are actually from the hand of Paul, as Philemon is, is an example. So I don't I don't I don't know what Christians would say. I have no clue what something you can ask them. Anyways, thank you for your question. Appreciate all right, that. Very good. All right, we'll move on to the next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. You're live on the air. Good Good morning, William and Rabbi Tobia. Good morning. How are you this morning? I am doing great. Rabbi I'm, is obviously doing great. <laughs> doing good. Good. Thank you. Okay, so I'm calling from, this is Bernadette calling from beautiful Barhead, Alberta. Oh, Actually, it's rainy, overcast, and freezing. Oh, wow. Cold, huh? Freezing? But it's... Yes. it's it's in June. Is, aren't you on the northern hemisphere? I don't understand that. Did, 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 yes. <laughs> well, it's like eight degrees or six degrees oh or something like oh, that this morning. Oh, it's June. Good Didn't golly. the weatherman get the I memo know. it's summer is approaching? <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't get it. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's not coming this year. <laughs> You're not in Brazil or something. I mean, that. What? The, okay, whatever. <laughs> Anyhow, it's South Africa, my question it's, is, right, it's winter. <laughs> I know. Anyhow, my question this morning is: um, in Ruth, um, when Ruth and Naomi come back, and uh, um, all the Israelites—well, it seems like it's not widely known that a Moabite woman can marry into the Jewish faith or a Jewish man. And I'm just wondering why, like it seems like only Boaz knows and and no one else knows. So was this an oral law? Was it uh, uh, what kind of law that the Jews wouldn't know this? Right. Good question. Good question. Okay, Bernadette, why don't you go ahead and hang up now and you can tune in for the answer, okay? Thank you for your call. Thank you. Take what? care. You bet. Bye-bye. All right. All right. So that's a, that's a great question. So as it turns out, R- Ruth, the great-grandmother of King David, was a Moabite, and the, the Torah tells us in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, that uh, that no an, a, a, someone from Ammon or from Moab, uh, from Moab Moabite, uh, they cannot enter the assembly of Jewish people uh, until the tenth generation. They can't marry in. Right? So the question is, 
how is it then that Ruth could not just marry him? She just didn't just like join, but as it turns out, she's the great great grandmother. Uh, she's the great grandmother of King David. King David is, for those of you who are not familiar with him, in a sense, the most popular person in Tanakh. Literally, he is King David is mentioned more frequently in the Jewish scriptures than any other person. Moses is mentioned 770 times. David is mentioned over a thousand times. So, v- very popular individual. And the, the answer is that the, there's the oral Torah, and the oral Torah has a modification. So, the Torah tells us in verse 4, 23 verse 4, that the reason why that they can't enter the congregation of Israel, which is who you can't marry in, is because they didn't uh, meet you and greet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. Um, and so on. There, there are other aspects of this. We'll just keep it there. But as it turns out, when an, an, a, a nation was passing through somebody else's land, uh, the people who were expected to be hospitable and to leave the home and greet complete strangers would have been men and not women. So as it turns out, this prohibition only applies to men, not to women. The Torah doesn't say so. This is the oral Torah. But as it turns out, the fact that a lot, many people were not familiar with Torah, both the written and oral Torah, is not a new phenomenon. Jewish illiteracy was alive and well. That was 3,000 years ago. People were really, you know, the, so that was, that was a huge problem. It, but bear in mind this, although the a Moabite test, a female Moabite, could uh, marry into the Jewish people, it still was a nation that had that just didn't have the best um, gold star rating. You know, didn't wasn't didn't have a five star rating on Amazon. So and, and and what is there are so many things being conveyed there. But, you know, one of the things is that, you know, that redemption can come from the oddest places. And sometimes you might feel that, I don't think God likes me very much. I've made some mistakes in my life, and who am I? I'm a nobody. I come from nothing. My parents were Christians. I was preaching Jesus when I was a a youngster, and I I was confessing. God probably really doesn't like me very much. I don't come from some illustrious family. I'm a nobody in God's eyes. Do you notice that what Tanakh is doing a lot of is focusing on all these people who really just did not come from the greatest, most illustrious families in God and, and saying, you know what, you can produce the greatest people that ever lived. Isn't that interesting? Abraham himself, what did he come from? His father was what? His father was the head of a yeshiva? No. His father was not just an idol worshiper, but Avram Avinu's father was engaged in the sale in commerce of idols. The point is, this is very hard for people. That Hashem is looking at your heart, and He wants you to be close to Him. That's all. And if anything is getting in the way of that relationship, it's you, not me, because I'm kind of crazy about you. I just want you in my life. So it isn't just an accident that Ruth, the grandmother of King David, comes from a family that is not a five-star family, that does not meet the gold, meet the gold standard. I could think of many contemporaries whose families were great illustrious families who in my view would be you know that's where i would ex- no no it's not it's not you know, hashem is really looking at your heart he really wants to be close to you and you really are created in the image of god and the moment you begin to doubt that the moment you begin to see yourself as unworthy as a sinner and 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 incapable of standing in the presence of God, you leave yourself vulnerable to the mother load of idolatry, and that's Christianity. 
because that's what every Sunday service goes like. In fact, if you're watching the show live, that means you're not in church. And that's what's going on. Down the block, there's a church service. That's what they're preaching, that you're a sinner and you can't be saved and you've got to, you know, and, and God can't even look at you, you're so dirty. If you are a Christian or ever were a Christian, and the majority of my viewers are or were, you know I'm not making this up. So, so, so is the fact that there was illiteracy going in that people weren't very well studied, so that's something that's, on the, that's something, this is not a big secret. This is what's going on today. You know, when we're worried about missionaries who are targeting Jews for conversion, if we were doing our job, if, if we were giving our men and women the proper education, these missionaries would be out of business in a second. So um, I, I'd like to focus on number, you know, number one, there was illiteracy at that time, no question. I mean, the, in order for us to come to a period in Jewish history, we would find an enormous amount of literacy. You would have to fast forward from the days of Ruth to, um, to the days of Hezekiah which means you would have to race forward about um, 400 years or so. So in days of Hezekiah, there really was mass literacy, and that would happen again, but n never as was during the days of Chizkiah Amel. Hezekiah was, a, was a, a great king on so many levels, and the Bible tells us, in fact, he was the greatest Davidic king who ever lived, who ever would live. So just... When Hashem says to you in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 and 7, that I'm really here, and I know you think you're worthless and you're a sinner, and you know God's there, but you don't feel like talking because you feel like he's not going to pay attention to me anyway. So the verse says, um, seek the Lord when he's nearby. It's okay. Call out to him. Call, seek the Lord when you find him. Call out to him when he's near. And then the passage, next passage says, look, if you think you're a sinner, here's the antidote. And you're not going to find it in Church of the Holy Sepulcher. You're going to find it in Isaiah 55, verse 6, and then, very importantly, verse 7. Those verses will not appear in a Christian Bible. I mean, they'll appear in the Isaiah part, but Paul's not quoting this kind of stuff. If the person of iniquity turns away from his sinful ways and gives up, abandons, his sinful thoughts, I will forgive him because my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So, of course, we can record the instance in, in Tanakh of King David's great-grandmother, understand that from the oral Torah it only applied to men and to women. Those who, who pretend to not believe in the oral Torah and say this is a iteration of the rabbis who just invented this in some sort of conspiracy. This is completely untenable. Completely untenable. And the reason why people I'm going to get a lot of hate mail, but the reason why people can entertain the notion that the oral Torah is an invention of the rabbis is because they're just not familiar with Tanakh. I guess. You, or you'd have to come up with some torturous explanation to explain this away. Listen up. You hear me? Because these kind of sects that, you know, we don't believe in the oral law, the oral written law, they're big internet set sects today. And, but you've got to answer these questions. I mean, the oral Torah it tells us that the, that the females can join the Jewish people and produce King David. So, but I don't, I don't want to get, confront the Karaites or whatever right now. Stay focused on this. There's a message here. You don't have to come from a fancy family with fancy parents to become a really fancy person in the eyes of God. Thank you for your question. All right. All right. All right. So, I take my, took my headphones off there for a minute to drink some coffee. So, hey, uh, very good. We'll move on to the next caller. Caller, you. What do you need coffee? You don't even need to do Dude, anything. Hey. You just send me, like, you're like. <laughs> You just you just get popcorn. You're and you have great seats. That would be a great idea to do. I, 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 I never thought about that. I should do. I should totally do that. Get popcorn. Just yeah. sit back and just. 
just watch you watch you do your thing. I've got to carry the <laughs> flagship show, not you. What do you without me? You'd be Cheers, folks. selling pencils from the tin <laughs> cup. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love you, Wayne. But hey, I love you too, Red Wayne. I love you too, man. You're awesome. All right, All right cool. Moving on. All right, uh, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hey, good day. This is Rudy from Edmonton, from Alberta. Rudy, welcome. Where it was minus oh, forty in the winter, Alberta. but in summer we have we have minus six. So come to the balmy minus plus <laughs> six, actually plus six, Alberta. Dang, get up the summer here. Ocean. Beautiful. <laughs> Very. I, um, <laughs> we're still wearing our parka, by the way, so that's all good. Wow. You wearing a parka well, or a burka? <laughs> What did you say? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, I still a parker, you say? A parka, yeah, winter parka. <laughs> I mean, it's June. I mean, what? Call. Here's what you need. Well, you need to call up uh, Canadian News and just talk to the weatherman and just say, "Hey, buddy, look at the calendar." <laughs> Like, well, I'm still warming. waiting for global warming. <laughs> but you know what? Like, God did give you guys the oil. So, you know, it was kind of trade off. You. It's like God <laughs> kind of put the oil wherever the weather stinks. So it's like, you know, you can either be roasting <laughs> in Saudi Arabia at 130 <laughs> degrees or freezing in, in June, but you got oil. So you got to figure that <laughs> That's out. That's right. We have, we have the oil. We have. The economy is good. So I um so I have a conundrum reading through Tanakh. Uh, come to chapter thirty one in Numbers, Numbers thirty one, where God instructs Moses to go against the Midianites for causing idolatry and harlotry of the people of Israel. And uh, Moses takes a thousand from each tribe, a total of twelve thousand that go up against the Midianites. And they, they wipe out the Midianites and I believe um, Balaam as well, right? And then it says that they, they came back with the with the loot and the, and there were women and children, male and female, and Moses was instructed that they should kill all the male children as well. And any women or girls that could have had relationships with men that that were mm-hmm. that you know, so anyways. God tells them to wipe out all the children, all the male children. Okay. So, and then we come to Judges chapter 6, where Gideon has to go up against the Midianites. So how do we, how is this conundrum that in Numbers 31, God tells Moses to wipe them all out. And then in in Judges 6, they're back. Like, how did they, how did they, come back when they were supposed to be all wiped out, all the male children, that means there were no male children to carry on the legacy of the Midianites. In my in my view, I, I don't understand how come they were again a powerful army that, that were threatening and, and they were harassing the, the, the Israelite people in hiding in caves and attacking them and things of that nature. So can you unravel this mystery for me? Yeah, yeah, sure, of course, of course. Uh, it's uh, anyways. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you, Rudy. Go ahead and hang up now, and you can tune in for your answer. Okay, appreciate your call. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right, buddy. Yeah, so that's really a great question. I mean, is, um, is that the the Midianites had seduced the Jewish people, sought to destroy them, and should have been wiped out, and then we we find the Midianites coming up, and not only do they come up in the book of Judges, but they come up in a firestorm and for seven years terrorize the Jewish people until God brings Gideon in um, as, as to wipe out the Midianites and miraculously they're wiped out. And the answer is that the, when we talk about the Midianites that were plagued the Jewish people in the wilderness, uh, that wasn't every Midianite in existence. Uh, those were just the Midianites that were present. They didn't travel to other lands where other parts of the tribe were. So, um, so, the, so every it's not that across the Levant, everywhere every Midianite was killed. It was just those who were present who were in the circu- who were in that circumstance in 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 the Book of Numbers and 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 there are other Midianites who eventually would emerge again and again and again. 
uh, who were not part of that specific conflict. All right, that's a great question. All right, very good. It's a short, fast answer. We like that. Very good. Okay, uh, caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hey, this is uh, Samuel from Kentucky. Samuel, um, welcome. I, now, thank you. This is the first time I actually had an opportunity to ask uh, Rabbi Singer a question on the air. Oh, um, fantastic! This is exciting. Very good. Very good. <laughs> um, so. My question is related to Isaiah chapter 14, where it uses the term Lucifer. Um, it's my understanding that they took that term from the Latin Vulgate, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it was added there, and a lot of Christians interpret that as being Satan. Um, they, they, you know, they, they tie that with Ezekiel 28, um, Matthew 24, and Revelation 12. Could you go into detail um, about, I just feel like that whole chapter now, Isaiah 14, is about uh, the king of Babylon, but um, I'd like to hear more about what, uh, what, you, what you think or what you teach uh, on that, Rabbi. Uh, thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for your question. Go ahead and hang up now. You continue for your answer. Appreciate the call. Mm -hmm. right, That's a really great question. I like you. And Samuel, I encourage you to make it through again on further um, other shows because that's a really thoughtful question. I, I discussed this in volume one of Let's Get Biblical. So as it turns out, this is probably going to surprise many people, but the name Lucifer appears nowhere in the Jewish Bible or the Christian Bible. Really? Really? Now, it's true that subsequent Bibles, Latin Bibles, would put that name in as the name of Satan, who's a, a fallen angel uh, conveyed in, in, particularly in the book of Revelation. But it, it doesn't appear there. So let's talk about what's going on in Isaiah chapter 14 and who is this Helel ben Shachar? What is The text is really referring to uh, the morning star. And it's speaking of, well, well, let me ask you the question. If you're looking, if, if you're up all night, which happens to me too frequently, and you're looking up at the sky, what is the last celestial body that you'll see? Uh, one footnote here in that although it's daylight, actually both here in Israel and the United States at this particular moment, so we're not going to see... Um, you see what time? Oh, yeah, it's daylight both here and in the United States. So we're not going to see, you know, uh, any of the planets and stars. But they're there. They're there. We just can't see them because there's just too much light. Okay? So the reason we don't see all these celestial bodies, which are visible at night, and if you're in a really remote place where there isn't unnatural light, then you really get to see uh, those brilliant starry nights. So the last celestial body, the brightest celestial body that we could see from our vantage point is the planet Venus. And in it, it, it's called Lucent, and it's called these names because it is so bright that it's the last heavenly body that's visible in the morning, and then it disappears. And this is a metaphor for the king of Babylon. Now, Isaiah, it should be noted, lived long before the Babylonian Empire. Isaiah never saw about the Babylonian Empire, although, like other prophets, he had a, a very unique way of teaching history. He frequently taught about history that hadn't yet occurred. And it should be noted that even those people who who doubt the authority and veracity of the of Tanakh or that Isaiah was written by Isaiah, it is usually conceded, almost always conceded, that Isaiah 1 through 39 was written by the real Isaiah, they say. That means this is coming from Isaiah even in the halls of, of, of Princeton Theological Seminary, or a pretty liberal place, or... Union Theological Seminary, or tragically in Hebrew University. All right, so anyway, so what what is coming into view right now? Isaiah is 
going to give all these burdens for all these nations that would arise and be enemy would become emerge as enemies of the Jewish people. And surely the Babylonian kings, they thought, they imagined that I'm, I'm always going to be there. Empires thought that we'll never leave, we'll never disappear. I'm, I'm sure the Soviet Union thought that they would never disappear. And Isaiah said, well, you, very. It's, it's a great metaphor. And that is, just like the planet Venus just hangs there, hangs in there. And the planet Venus, in a sense, thinks that I'm not going anywhere because you could still see me in the morning. What happens to the planet Venus? Just, just a little more light from the sun, and then it disappears. And that's the nature of all these kingdoms that arise and are around for a, a brief time, and then they disappear. And they're nothing. And if you want to know about the great empires, the Babylonian Empire, you have to you have to um, look at um, go to the library and blow the dust off of history books and read about them. You know, I want I, if I may, I, I want to. So that that's what the text is talking about. If I may, I want to read to you. A, 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 just a little piece written by the my favorite American writer and humorist, uh, Mark Twain. He writes this about the Jews um, in, the, in the end of the 19th century. Um, he, this is, this is, these are the words of Mark Twain about the Jewish people. It should be said that Mark Twain was not noted to be a, a very, he's not noted for his religious piety. He's not noted for his, as a, as a great believer. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of. But he is heard of, has always been heard of. He's as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk, his contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learnings are also way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. Bear in mind, this is not written recently. This is the end of the, the end of the 19th century. He's made a marvelous fight in this world and all the ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian arose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, and then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they're gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held the torch high for a time, but are burnt out, and they sit in twilight now, or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Thank you for your question. Yeah, that was definitely a great question for sure. All right, moving on. Uh, Rabbi, how's your timing today? Do you have to stop at a certain time? It's it, in, in 25 minutes. Got it. You got it. Okay, very good. So we've got time for a few more calls, then, or at least one more anyway. So, Okay, very good. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. You are live. Shalom. Hi, I'm Micah. 
Okay. I have a question. Welcome to the show. Yes. Yes. In a fragment of the Gospel of Peter, discovered 1884, the story of the treachery of Judas wasn't included. In addition to the rebuke of Jesus to his apostles to lower the status in favor of Paul, shortly later, Pope Pius IX implemented at the First Vatican Council in uh, 1870 the Pope's dogma of infallibility. In addition, we have to see the rebukes of Jesus to his apostles without making a full cut. Can we see here to the motivation to lower the status in common, but also the religious authority of the Jewish people and in favor of belief monopoly from the church, ending in the dogma of the infallibility? You have to forgive because me. Your dialect shortly, is really strong, so it's kind of hard for me to understand. Uh, Rabbi, okay. were, were you able to... Uh, we see that uh, the um, the treachery of Judas wasn't okay. included till 1884. Okay, hmm. and shortly, and it, it can, at this time, the 1870 treachery of Judas Iscariot. The treachery of Judas was yes. not added until 1884. Is that like a new addition to the yes. Bible? It's in the gospel. Uh, yes. Let me ask you and, this um, question, Michael. If I may, uh, because uh, you yes, know, on uh, air, it's, if you're just uh, reading off, I think maybe it's is it possible that we could speak now, personally? Is, uh, I, I, uh, I have it from Human Mekobai from, um, I think, Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. He's, we didn't, he wrote oh, by Chaim Maccabi. Um, I don't, I, I don't know the page. C O B Y. It's in the it's in the appendix, but um, he wrote that before 1884 it wasn't included. And when I um, looked at the church history, at the same t um, time point, 1870, the Pope uh, included the dogma of the infallibility. Um, can we see here uh, the, that exact at this time? They try to lower the st um, religious authority of the Jewish people because um, why did they include the treachery of Judas? At the same time, the Vatican Council implemented the dogma of the instability. All right, so let me just say this to you. Um, I knew Maccabi when he was alive and I've read all of his works, but I, I'm not offhand familiar with this footnote, um, the belief that the Pope... Anyways, thank you for your question, Michael. Okay. Michael, go ahead and hang up now. You can tune in for your answer, okay? Thank you for your call. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Right, yeah, so uh, so basically the claim is, but what he's saying is that the treachery of Judas story wasn't added. In fact, it wasn't even in the 1611 King James. It was added in 18-something. Is that is that what he was saying, Rabbi? I'm, I, I confess I'm not I'm not really completely sure because the okay. uh, ju, ju, the betrayal of Judas Iscariot is is in the Gospels, um, so I, I'm, I and therefore it would probably be a better idea for me to although I the book I believe it's called Revolution in Judea, uh, written by Maccabi was a professor at Lee's University and and was a dear friend of mine passed away a number of years ago. I, I don't I don't recall all the footnotes. The the doctrine of infallibility that the Pope that anything the Pope said ex cathedra from uh, from the throne was infallible. That was officially a doctrine that was adopted in fairly recent times, but in truth, uh, Christians believe that the the Bishop of Rome's uh, expressions were infallible in a much, much earlier state, just a much earlier time, just like other doctrines. It didn't, uh, the, the celibacy of the priesthood may have begun officially at a later stage, but in reality, uh, celibacy was the accepted practice for priests long, long before that. Uh, but but I, I confess that I'm not, I, I'm not familiar with that footnote. I don't have the book in front of me. My library never even made it to 
never even made it to Indonesia. It's actually still in New York. So I don't know. I have, I have everything Kobe wrote, but it's, uh, I, I went from the United States to, and I, I have like a library of a few thousand books. It was just too much to pack. I, I don't know. In, I don't, I don't have that in front of me right now, but the, um, the treachery of Judas Iscariot, um, uh, is, is very old. And although the new Testament differs on precisely how Judas Iscariot committed suicide, um, the fact that he betrayed uh, Jesus in the Gospels is everywhere. I could go on and talk about this. Very, there's some really interesting things, but I think it would prevent a, another question from coming. So I, I don't have that in front of me. Thank you uh, for calling in. Okay. Let's continue. Okay, very good. All right. Caller, you're live on the air. Uh, please show us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, hello. Are you can hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Levin from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, Matthew. What's the question for everybody? My question is about Tikkun Sotharim, also known as Tikkun Ezra. Um, I came across this, and I really didn't completely understand it, and I wanted some clarification as to what this was, and furthermore, why this wasn't essentially blatant editing of our holy scriptures. So I'd appreciate an answer um, from one priest to another. I'm a Levite. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, so you're, you're part of the family. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So we're related. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much for that. that. That's a great question. I don't think in all the years anyone's... Yeah, I don't recall that either. I don't think anyone's ever asked that question, so let me review it. Okay. Thank you very much. Go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answer. Thanks, Mike. All right, guys, it's probably going to be the last question of the day, possibly, unless this ends up being kind of a short answer. Really? Okay, so this is a really, really good question. And I'm going to um, just fill in the parts, because I think people listening to this might not grasp the uh, what exactly is being asked here. So um, this fellow called an Esma was called Tikkun Sofrim. Tikkun Sofrim means the uh, emendations or adjustments that were performed by the scribes. What is that? Well, there are different views on precisely what this means. There are different views. But let's take the view that the questioner has, and there is a view that way, that there's a, there's a, a couple, a handful of passages in Tanakh where the sages, going back thousands of years ago, made an adjustment in the text I believe there are 18 such places in the text that that were changed, but an announcement was made that I want you to know that this was changed because it just was very unpleasant to have this in the text. But we will want you to know it's there. Okay, uh, let me give you an example of such a text. Um, Let's take in the book of Job. So in the book of Job, we're introduced to Job's wife, I believe, only one time. That's in the second chapter of Job. And Job's wife is, is, is a, a bit of a problem. In fact, in the book of Job, almost everybody's a problem besides Job. And Job's wife gives him advice and says, ishtai, and his wife said to him, said to him, oh, are you still holding on to your integrity? Like, you, you're not willing to... Because Job is, despite all the vicissitudes he was enduring, he was unwilling to curse God. He would curse himself. He would curse the womb. In the very next chapter, he would curse the womb that he was conceived in, which he was never born. But Ultimately, he never curses God, and he emerges as one of the great people of history. And if you look at the very end, and, and William, I don't know which Bible you're looking at. I can pull up. Uh, well, uh, Job 2, verse 9 is an example. Do you want the Hebrew Bible, or do you want like a King James? No, just a, anything. No, but bring up a Hebrew, English, 
English English is good. And anyone, it doesn't make a difference what, what you use. Okay, cool. I'm going to pull up right now. Yeah. Okay, it is on your screen. Then set yeah. his wife unto him, dost thou still retain thine integrity, curse God and die? Yeah, so it's interesting. So she's saying, why don't you just curse God and die? That's his, her advice to him. Brilliant advice. Now, it's very interesting that the 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 sofrim, the scribes, did not want to have the words curse God in the text. The, it was just something that was unbearable. Now, we want you to know that that was the advice she was given. She was giving her husband. But it's such blasphemy that the, they amended the text and announced to everyone, we should know, we're amending this text. If you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew says something outrageous. The Hebrew says, Barech Elikim Vamus. She says, what does Barech mean? What does Baruch mean? Like Baruch Ato Hashem, what does Baruch mean? The Hebrew actually says, bless God and die. Okay? So what ha- so what 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 happens is you have texts in Tanakh for a wide variety of reasons that the ancient scribes felt that look we want you to know what really is going on here but there's something here that is is so grievous that we're going to do two things number one we're going to change the way the text looks but we want you to know that we changed it so that when you read it, make sure you know that she's saying, curse God, and she doesn't say, th- make sure you know that she's saying, curse God, and doesn't say, bless God. Okay. So, so imagine for a moment the difference between that, where you say to everyone, I have an announcement, you know, when it says this, just know it really says that, but this is just something so hurtful, so painful, that we're going to write it differently, but make sure you know that's what it really says. So that's what's being forthright. When you're playing hide the ball, when you're playing a show game, when you change text and don't tell anyone that you've altered the text, so then you're playing a game. Then you're trying to bring contraband into a country, and you're going to the green the green area, which is, you know, when you when you travel internationally and you arrive in a country, you can either go to declare or, or don't declare, and you have nothing to declare. And if you go through, you have nothing to declare, and you bring in something that you really should have declared. Well, if you just brought in stuff like you should have paid taxes on um, here in Israel, the, your taxes will be doubled, and that's if it's something that's not illegal. Right? If it's just something you're supposed to pay in Israel, there's a 17% tax on electronics, as an example. So if you bring in a new stereo system, if you declare it, you pay the 17% tax going in. That's if it's something illicit, if it's something that's not contraband. If you, if you go through the I have nothing to declare line and you get caught, so then you have to pay double that. You have to pay 34% tax. It can be quite the fortune. Now, you all know what happens if it's illicit. That means if you're bringing drugs or anything like that, well, then you're going to wind up in prison. All right, I, I need not explain this. So the point is, if you declare it, it's okay. If you fake it, if you take Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, and just splice off the end that you may do it, and don't tell anyone that you did it, or Matthew 123 and change the very meaning of the most important word to prove that the Messiah is supposed to be born a virgin and take the word Alma, which conveys a youth and gender, a young woman, rather than sexual history, Basula. If you change those words, so then you're you're then you're committing a crime. There's no crime in saying, look, I, I just don't want to write. G-O-D. So there are religious Jews that when writing G-O-D, even though the word God is not a Hebrew word, it's a part of the English language, 
But if it's a capital G-O-D, it conveys that this is the true God. And there are many pious Jews who, in writing just G-O-D, will do capital G hyphen D. So it's, that's you're amending the spelling of the text. Why? Out of reference for, reverence for God. You don't have to do this. Just pious Jewish people do this. But no one is saying that that's how you spell the word God. So therefore, because you're announcing, you're making it very clear with some sort of, with, with some sort of, and you have actually many more cases of this in what's called the way things are written and the way things are pronounced. So what is nefarious about the Christian Bible is it's a con game. It's nefarious. The intent is to change what the original text says and that people actually believe it. It's They're changing the verbs from the past tense into the future tense in Isaiah chapter 9 because it's a con game. It's like people who who swallow condoms filled with cocaine and try to get through uh, customs. That's a scam. That's that's illicit. So, um, so that's what's that's what the difference is. So, if you if we have a, a, a number of passages, not a lot, very very few, where we're we're telling you, look, this is what it says. For whatever reason, we're changing it, but just know that's what it really says. That's fine as long as you announce it. Just don't don't keep it a secret. Okay, so that's a really great question. And all the years we're doing the show, I don't think anyone's ever asked that question. So thank you. Okay, all right, Rabbi, I'm, I'm going to take this last call. You got about eight minutes left. Uh, if it turns out to be a complicated question, it will require more time. Then we can we can just stop to do that next week if it's uh, if it's going to take too long. Okay. Yes. Okay, Kelly, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where you calling from? Hi, uh, I'm John from Bahrain. John, welcome. So, so yeah, thank you. I just have a question for the Rabbi. So, uh, it's regarding the national revelation again. So we understand that the Jews don't believe in miracles. Okay, that's the reason they didn't believe in Moses also, like for example. Uh, uh, could you do me a favor he, real fast? Uh, uh, I'm hearing a, yeah. a, a lot of background noise, like clanging. It sounds like you might be in a soup kitchen or something. This is... Yeah, I'll go inside. Okay, so now it's okay. Or in a prison or so, something. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so in so the protest. question is... Yeah, actually I'm at work, so okay. I love to find open space to speak. <laughs> yes, sir. Very so, good. Thank you. Uh, the question is the, regarding national revolution. I know that Jews don't believe in miracles and all. That's the reason they, even though uh, Moses... I need, I need you to really I slow mean, down. Yeah, tell us, uh, yeah, okay. and just, just real clearly, slow. if you don't mind. I know that yeah, Jews... Yeah, I'll slow, okay, no. Yeah, so uh, the Jews don't, didn't believe in Moses, for example, because of the miracles he performed, like through God, of course like splitting of the Red Sea and et cetera, et cetera. But even during the national revelation, there's still a question arises. What if Moses pulled it out, you know, like, for example, what if it was like a trick or a magic trick? Mm. So mm. that's my question. That's also part of miracle. I didn't like when, really when get the whole, I, 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 you know, John, I'm, I'm not in a rush. I know the show's over to but just really slow. You, yeah, I okay. just didn't get your I, the 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 rub. You, okay, fine. I'll go and do it again. But go slow. I don't. So I know that you just like real slow. Uh, real John slow. Uh, and oh, Rabbi okay. Rabbi and John, one second. So uh, what I got from that was: is it possible that Moses, the whole revelation, national revelation, could have been a trick, some sort of? Because we know there's a lot of ancient history that we know about Egyptians, where there's some technology they had that went away, and now all of a sudden we got it again. They're doing things that seem impossible back then. Is it possible that Moses? Could yeah. have had performed all of these things through not miracles, but yes. through through some sort of um, uh, some some other source, whether it be you know. Yes, because exactly. So maybe this can also be part of a miracle. Why? How did Jews fell for it? Like when they hear that God came, like they heard through a fire or smoke. Right. Very maybe good. Uh, Moses could have pulled it out. You know. Yeah. You know, understand? So that's the question. Okay, very good. Michael, thank you so much for your call. Oh, we'll go ahead and pass this along to Rabbi. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much for You betcha. Uh, bye-bye. Okay, bye. okay, Rabbi, you got that pretty clear now? 
<laughs> so I think I do have it. I mean, you know, so, the history of we you can see right now ancient aliens, there's these T V shows that's out there now, and they show you things that are like, Man, there is no way with the technology that they that we didn't think that they did have that they could have pulled off some of the feats that they've done. Um, you know, and now we see stuff that's like I mean, almost impossible for even people to do it now, even with modern machines. So is that a possibility with Moses? Uh, so that's where the Torah is co- completely and utterly unique. And although the Jews are not, um, may not be the most popular people on earth, but the Torah says that, in fact, all the nations will look at our Torah and say, what a wise Torah is this and what a wise people to have such a Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 4. So as it turns out, the miracles that the Jews bore witness to are completely unique in in the annals of history. And that's because they occurred in the context of a national revelation, which means that the entire nation of Israel was there. The national revelation, in fact, the, the, tech, the passage in the Torah where we see that the Jewish people trusted both God and Moses occurred not at Mount Sinai, but a little bit earlier in, in Exodus uh, chapter 14, verse 31. Vayar Yisrael es hayod ha-gadayla, uh, and, and the nation of Israel and um, saw the great hand, Hashem, also Hashem b'mitzrayim, what God had done in Egypt. Vayir ha-om, and the whole nation, Vayirom es Hashem, and the whole nation apprehended the presence of God. The context of this is that the entire Egyptian army drowned, pursuing them. The, the sea parted for an entire nation. It's not just a group of people in upstate New York who saw gold plates. This is everybody. The entire nation was there. And then the text says, Vayaminu ba'ashem v'moyesha avado. And they believed in God and Moses, his servant. So what is completely unique about the the revelation in, throughout the Exodus and a whole series of stages is that it wasn't someone saying, look, take my word for it. There's this guy in, in, in South Korea who was healed of cancer and, and it was something happened there and something happened. No. Everyone was there. Everyone was present. It was a, an event that occurred in an, on a national scale. And as it turns out, the Torah tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4, the fact that this is something that would never happen again. Um, the Torah says, Shall no, please ask all earlier days, has any event like this has ever occurred? Has any nation seen miracles? Have you seen and lived? You have been shown this so that you may know that I am God and there is no other God. The events in um, in the Torah are so unique, particularly, specifically attached to the Exodus and the giving of the Torah of Mount Sinai are so completely unique because everyone was there. Everyone in a sense, was a prophet. Let's do it that way. Everyone heard the voice of God. At this stage, everyone saw the sea part and the entire Egyptian army perish. And then God further does a miracle where the Egyptians who drowned, who were, who were destroyed in the Red Sea, um, were washed ashore on the side of where the Israelites were who had just passed through on dry land. That didn't have to happen. You know, they, they could have gone down, they could have washed up on the other side, and that was an enormous relief to see their oppressors dead in front of their eyes. Zekeli v'yanvehu. In unison, the nation pointed their finger at, at heaven and said, this is my God, and, and I will beautify him. So the, what is completely unique here, it is not that we have a prophet saying, take my word for it. Everybody was there. Everyone was there. 
The entire nation was there. And not only that, the Torah tells us that this is never going to happen to anyone. That means no one's going to even make this claim in history. The Torah is talking to you in Deuteronomy 4.32, to you and me, and saying, please, it says, Sha'al no, please ask. From all time that's gone past, from one end of the world to the other, has anyone ever made such claim? Anyone ever seen God and seen these miracles and lived to tell about them? If there was, we could throw the Torah in the garbage. The author of the Torah is the God of the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are there. Look at these words. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. These are words that nowhere else is a nation spoken to like this. Atu horeis ladas. You were shown this. Ladas. The word das means knowledge, not faith. You have been shown this on ladas. Ki Hashem hu elikim. That the Lord is God. Ein oid movado. There is nothing else besides him. Nothing. There is an Ephes Kamoni. There is nothing like me. Look, if, if you read today, you say, you know, Hashem, my heart is open to you right now. And I'm ready to receive you in my life. And I, I, I want to follow you. I just want to know a little bit about you. And I just want to make sure. Please read these passages. Read Exodus 14. It was a national event. No, no one else would ever even make such a claim. And, and I, I should add in as a very important caveat, it really is a much better claim to make. The claim that God revealed himself to an entire nation. Every American saw it. Every, every descendant of Jacob, the whole B'nai Israel bore witness to it, experienced it. That is a really gr- amazing claim. It is a far superior to claim to make than, you know, someone told me that God spoke to me. I believe it or I might I choose may choose not to believe it. And therefore I want to say this to you, my dear brothers and sisters. The foundation upon our entire belief is the events of of the Exodus and the culmination in the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. I, I, if you ask me, show me proof that Avram, our father of blessed memory, encountered uh, three angels immediately after his circumcision, I don't have it. It's just, it's in the Torah of Moses, our teacher, and therefore, because of the national revelation, I believe the Torah, all of the Torah, Follow what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. the events, the, 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 the events that occurred during the days of Moses, our teacher, though that is the foundation of Judaism, everything else that we believe is based on that foundation. And they believed, they trusted in God and Moses, his servant. Thank you for that question. Shalom. All right, Rabbi. Well, that was sure was a full and uh, very exciting show. Lots of great questions for sure. Um, guys, don't forget to go to outreachjudaism.org uh, for your own set, two-volume book set, uh, Rabbi Toby the Singers. Uh, let's get biblical. And uh, with all the information we've had so far, we're definitely working on a, uh, approaching an era of volume three and four. <laughs> So uh, with all these videos and all these new questions that have been coming up. uh, So again, thank you guys for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And don't forget to also, uh, when you're searching for uh, comments, I'm I'm sorry, when you're searching for topics and questions, and Rabbi, you can explain this with me as well, uh, go to any, any YouTube channel mine, Rabbi Singers, whatever the case may be, just go into the YouTube search channel and type in Tovia Singer slash Virgin Birth, Tovia Singer slash the Al-Qaeda, whatever you want to put in there. And it's chances are it's going to pull up at least one video, maybe maybe multiples, uh, that have those uh, topics somewhere in the video. So it's an easy, quick way to get to it. Likewise, if anybody, anybody has questions uh, looking for something we've already done, feel free to send me an email uh, and I will try to send you a link. Uh, or if you're on Facebook, you can find me that way as well. Uh, Rabbi, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed your 
uh, company as always, and we look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week, uh, Hashem Rolling. So uh, thank you, Rabbi, once again. And um, people, thank you so much for, for everything. Be sure to turn on the subscription uh, and the notification bell. I'm, I'm getting messages from time to time still uh, where people, after I put a post up on Facebook and, and actually a post on YouTube of start times, that some people still aren't getting notified. Uh, so if we're on Facebook together, just go to my Facebook page, not to Knock Talk, but actually to William Hall, and you will be able to see any any updated post uh, so the way facebook works sometimes also is unless you actually are following the person you're not going to get you're not going to get notified every time they post something so that might be something if you want to consider if you're not getting notifications follow me on facebook as well that way whenever i post something it will show up in your news feed so uh but anyway until next week uh actually until later we've got more shows on it for you so we'll see you guys soon and thanks for tuning in shalom everybody Thank you.